coming to you live from Bismarck, North Dakota, Waukesha, Wisconsin, San Diego, California, and the Oklahoma that got lost in California, otherwise known as the home of Buck Owens, Bakersfield, California, is the constitution in American life with the friends of Publius. The FOPs are not only excited about continuing the constitutional, continuing the constitutional questions and issues that we are faced with on a daily basis, but are also extremely excited about the beginning of MLB Major League Baseball's spring training, where in a very brief period of time, hope springs eternal. <laughs> Just like the Constitution, there are a myriad of questions dealing with the upcoming MLB season. Is this the beginning of the end of the Dodger National League dynasty? Will this season signify the resurrection of the Cubs and Giants? Will the Brewers be able to win a single series against the Cubs? Oh, the anticipation is killing me. This morning, afternoon, evening, or night, whenever it is you choose to view the Constitution of American Life, we will be dealing with the issue of state sovereignty, which was birthed under the Articles of Confederation and addressing the question as to how much of that sovereignty did the states retain after the ratification of the Constitution of 1787? What were the early growing pains experienced by a nation that divided sovereignty? And how were those pains addressed during the era of reconstruction? So let's get to it. But students are asked uh, to address the following quote from Patrick Henry at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Henry uh, declared at that convention that every right was retained by the states respectively, which was not given up to the government of the United States. And so in looking at this, uh, Professor Tim Moore uh, out there in Wisconsin, as we evaluate Henry's quote, I guess what jumped out at me, uh, not being the scholar of this era as you are, is I'm wondering what he meant. I, I did not know that they used, and this is going to show just how you know, <laughs> shallow my knowledge is, I did not know that they used the United States uh, uh, of America. Uh, 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 is that the phrase? Uh, uh, or the government of the United States. I did not know that they used that phrase uh, during the articles period. So what did Henry mean by that phrase? And what was meant by the phrase government of the United States under the Articles of Confederation? Um, well, it, uh, first of all, it was, uh, it was used, uh, that phrase was used um, quite a bit. Um, the, where it comes from is, uh, if you, if one way to think about his, his expression would be, it's a government of the United States, even, even, the, even the articles is, because it was approved by the states um, uh, as late. I think Maryland was the last one to uh, to ratify the Articles of Confederation. So there's a unitedness um, amongst the states to get us the Articles of Confederation. I guess um, I don't. I'm not quite sure exactly. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it's because I've seen that phrase, you know, in in a lot of the documents that we deal with. So I guess it wasn't it wasn't particularly surprising to me that that phrase was used. So I'm I'm kind of I'm well, a little I, I, I'm a little flummoxed as to as well, to your your confusion about that phrase. Well, because again, because uh, you know, <laughs> more uh, common for me is to take a presidentist approach, and the notion of a United States is a notion of a union. All right. Uh, 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 and uh, in a union, uh, there is uh, a, a great degree, uh, whether it's a union of marriage, I guess you could say, or a union of the states, there is a great degree in which you have to give up, all right, your own identity in order for, for you to be united. And so to me, uh, if we were a confederate, you know, uh, 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 situation, if we called ourselves a confederacy, that message that gives a, a certain message, sure. and I understand that when we say a United States, united in what way? That is, in, in, I, I guess if you can kind of make a distinction there, when they're using that term that that we are a, a United States, in, in what way are we united? 
under the articles well we we have a we have a national constitution and it has uh it has powers although limited compared to the uh, the uh, the constitution's powers that congress has um so i guess there's uh, i guess when they when they would say uh, united states of america it is a united thing of of confederated states uh which i think probably is to your point uh, why wouldn't uh, why wouldn't the phrase be a united thing of confederated states? But um, and that's and that's quite often what they did mean, even if they were using the phrase United States of America. Well, can I, Dave, can I jump in here for a sec? Uh -huh. um, Tim, I have a, a kind of a question because I, I if, if students look at the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, they use the term, uh, you know, United States in that last paragraph. So. Um, obviously, Tim, you're the go-to guy for this. So, do we see that in documents prior to the, you know, Declaration in '76? Well, sure. There's a, there's constant um, like during the uh, during the Revolution, there were uh, there's all kinds of documentation. Like, for example, the uh, the folks that were sent to uh, to France uh, to uh, negotiate a treaty and loans. Um, Adams, I think, is in, he's in the Netherlands, John Jay's in Spain, and they, they use that phrase as they're making their pitches uh, to, uh, to these various nations in Europe in, in diplomatic terms. So it, it is used even during the revolution uh, to describe the United States. Well, I mean, now the irony is there, <laughs> that's a fig leaf in practice. Uh, so the words, uh, you, you know, I, I um, I've often said that sometimes what's on paper um, is belied as to as to as, a, as to oppose what's actually going on. But the phrase itself is is a common phrase. Well, I, you just you just kind of you know took the words out of my mouth. This is this 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 is all on paper. I mean, there, there, there's a, you can say it. We are the states united, or we are the United States uh, here. And and I think the way you phrase that is is very important. And yeah, you say we have a national government, but we have a national government that pretty much uh, is is powerless. I mean, what what can the national government do without the unanimous or what is it nine thirteen three fourths agreement of of the states? I mean, they no. don't they don't they don't have independent they don't have military powers. They well they 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 can uh, they can negotiate. Uh, they can negotiate treaties. They can pass uh, significant legislation. Uh, they actually have tremendous powers when it comes to the Northwest Territories. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, I, I would. I've often uh, thought that we should consider the articles um, based on what the aspirations of those folks who wrote the articles, not what the aspirations of those who wrote the Constitution. It seems to be like you're judging. Uh, you're judging the article. I mean, in some in, in some ways, the articles were successful in what they were designed to do. Now, when you compare it to the to the Constitution, uh, it's easy to see how uh, the power just alone on powers, uh, you can you can come to the conclusion that the articles um, are insufficient or a failure. Uh, but within themselves, I think um, there's uh, there's an argument to be made that they're not necessarily a failure. Now, again. The, the fact is that all through the 80s, there's constant attempts to raise revenue. And those amendments that are formally proposed all, all um, do not succeed. So uh, there's the there's the big reason that, um, you know, if they if they'd have passed one of those, if, they, if they'd have passed the impost of 83, um, I don't know that we'd have had a new constitution uh, because then Congress would have had an independent source of revenue and they wouldn't have been beholden to the states in simply requesting funds from the states. They could have actually directly taxed and raised revenue through through imports. Well, I mean, again, there the flaws of this so-called United States national government reveal themselves fairly quickly. I mean, can you have a union out of a confederacy? And in in can you have a true union in a confederate structure? Because it seems to me that that Hamilton in what, 1781 in the Continentalist Papers is already attacking the very notion that we could be a union within a confederacy. 
You're right. Uh, and, and he, and not just Hamilton, uh, but the continentalist uh, essays are, are a great example of this isn't going to work. I mean, I don't, I don't think the ink is even dry on the ratification of the articles and he's already uh, given them, given them the what for is, is uh, uh, you know, th they're going to fail. Um, so yeah, it, it, from the get go, there's not uh, the nationalists all through the eighties uh, are really trying hard uh, to well, there's there's two kinds of nationalists. The one kind of nationalist wants to work within the articles to strengthen the articles, and then there's the the, the nationalists like Hamilton that are interested in in a whole new system. Uh, so you have those two uh, uh, factions, I guess, within the nationalist uh, wing uh, of politics in the '80s. But to your question about uh, motivation, what would have motivated him to say that? I think, I think. I think there's a lot of motivations for Henry. Well, to I, I want to—is he being an originalist? Is that—is that his ploy here? Is he no. saying, "Hey guys," and now because he's—he's doing this in what 1788? Is he going yeah. back and saying, "Hey, this is who we said we were in 1777, 1781"? It almost seems to me like he's saying, "You know, let's not lose sight of who we established ourselves as." You know, yeah. ten years prior. So I'm sorry. I go think. Ahead. I, I think uh, that's a good point that he's, he wants to be an originalist based upon a particular document. But I think if you look at, uh, I had the misfortune today of read, reading all of his speeches, not only on the 16th of June, but the 15th, the, uh, the 14th, the 13th, and the 12th. Um, well, that'll drive a man to drink. Oh, golly. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, this is totally unrelated, but there's one point where he raises an issue. I forget what it was. But Madison, uh, whoever was doing the recording of the Virginia Convention, Madison was quoted as saying uh, in eloquent terms, he had no idea why Patrick Henry was raising this issue at this time, because it has nothing to do with what we're supposed to be talking about. Uh, but Henry does that quite a bit through the whole convention, not just the several days before this. But I think um, I think the quote used in the question, though, and I, I and I know students will do this. So their teachers will have them make sure you're reading on both sides of that. And not only that, you might have to put yourself through the same laborious uh, torture that uh, that uh, Professor Moore went through. <laughs> but I think this passage is actually more so about a bill of rights. Yes, and lacking and that's a bill, a exactly. Bill of rights. But um, what what preceded it was like three four days in a row of him uh, railing against powers. Oh yeah, but with the consolidation, most, the whole idea. Oh, yeah, of most of the day on the sixteenth, he's uh, he and others are uh, waxing eloquent about the militia powers, and then in the uh, towards the end of the day, uh, Patrick Henry asks. I mean, to Chris's point, he asks, "Does somebody read?" The Virginia Bill of Rights, which they did, and then I think that's when Madison said, "You know what the heck has this got to do with anything?" Because we were talking about the militia power before this. So Chris is exactly right. This quote is is uh, be careful because the context was about the need for a Bill of Rights, but everything that preceded it was about powers. And and for days, Patrick Henry is railing against uh, the, his per his perceptions that the powers would uh, overtake. Um, state prerogatives and state powers and state state rights. And to David, to your point, to your initial question, I think if, if there's another passage that um, Henry is uh, ripping, not directly, but on Governor Morrison on the preamble. You know, where did who? How do you? Where do you get to say we the people? It's not the people; it's the states. So he's already laid the groundwork for saying this should not say we the people, it should say we the states. And as we know that, and hopefully students realize that that's what Governor Morris, who wrote the preamble originally had before he changed it, was we the states, right? Not we the people, but he changes that, which holy smokes, that just changes everything. But Patrick Henry, in one of those previous speeches, was ripping on that whole notion of taking that presumption, uh, presumptive idea that they're speaking for the people and not the states. One, one of the things, I, back to your point about was Henry being an originalist, I think in, in addition to that, I think he also is in that speech uh, on the 16th of June, he makes a historical argument and he says, look, in England, if things aren't explicitly uh, delegated and expressed, everything else is royal prerogative. 
So if we don't expressly state powers, um, it will it will it will become the prerogative of the national government. So uh, any and there are other nations that he uses as arguments there. So if if he's being an originalist, and I, I guess I'd never thought about it that way, but I I, I kind of like that. Um, he's also being a, a historian and saying, let's look at history when uh, things aren't explicitly played out. And I think the American Revolution, too, plays into this as well, uh, when the parliament at that point assumed a lot of prerogatives because the British Constitution is not ex explicitly, expressly uh, delegated powers. It's all um, within parliament, the national government. So, Professor Kavanaugh, um, is it accurate to say that the Philadelphia Convention established a system of dual sovereignty? If not, why is that not accurate? If so, what are the challenges of creating such a system? Uh, well, we're, it's our favorite F word, isn't it? Um, federalism. Uh, I don't think I would say no. It did. I think it. I think the Constitution that comes out of Philadelphia changes the argument. I want to go back to something you had asked him about, David. Um, uh, did it create a, a, this union? Yeah, it did. The articles did. It's just a weak one, right? It's just a weak union. I always, I always equate it to like. Um, um, it sounds like you know, a Vegas that, marriage to me. So uh, well, go I ahead. Was, yeah, I always <laughs> um, equate it to um, the United Nations. How much power does the United Nations have? It has as much power as the member nations allow it to have. So how much power did the national government under the articles have? They had, it has as much power as the states allowed it to have, which wasn't a whole heck of a lot. But um, here's my pro problem. Power is, is, is obviously, and we're going to, this is going to obviously, it's the theme, I think, of the whole question. You know, power is, is, is what binds a union together. All right. And with, without, without some clarity about where power, you know, sits, all right, uh, that union is, of course, a, a very fragile union uh, there, and and no. so I guess that's my my. Well, so you it, and I just want to make sure I understood. You, you say it's not accurate to say that. Well, they I think created du dual sovereignty. I think it changes the argument about sovereignty because I mean um, I always think of this sliding scale of sovereignty from the beginning of co the colonial period through the revolutionary period post-revolutionary period into the constitution making period then into philadelphia of 1787 so you start to see sovereignty slide from you know the crown to the parliament to parliament to the colonial governments to the colonial governments to the early state governments uh, luckily that you know we win the revolution spoiler alert um and then we have this articles of confederation you still have sovereignty resting the bulk of sovereignty resting with the states congress is able to do some things as tim alluded to the northwest ordinance a very powerful piece of legislation coming out of the uh, the uh, confederation congress um but now with this document out of philadelphia in 1787 clearly with the supremacy clause um and the uh, the um creating a, a stronger much much stronger central government um it does create a dual sovereignty if you will and that argument is not going to i don't know the the argument was settled i'd say in 1865 but we still argue about it to this point to this day um <laughs> You might want to, you know, write at least uh, five or six members of the current Supreme Court. Uh, uh, you know, your notions that that was settled in 1865. Uh, there, Here, here's but, my uh, problem. There's one, other, there's one other clause that is equally as important as uh, supremacy, uh, and it's the treaty clause. Um, I mean, a lot of states uh, really were suspicious about losing some sovereignty when uh, when treaties were defined as being supreme law of the land. Uh, they, in fact, a lot of anti-federalist literature really, really goes uh, ballistic on on the treaty statement in the Constitution. And, and part of me, if I want to sit here and put on my 2023 goggles and look at Mr. Henry from afar, um, he is a he is a machine politician, and he has Virginia in the palm of his hands, right? And you're talking an incredibly powerful state, economically, politically. 
why why does he want to give that up right and so you, you can see and then the students know that famous quote from the text that he smelt a rat right coming out of philadelphia um so, so we know that people don't want to give up power so uh the cynical side of me saying of course he's the, the head of the political machine in virginia he's not going to get one to share power so but it does create this idea of dual sovereignty and you can see arguments being made you can't serve two masters that idea okay so there i mean i I mean, here's my problem. You know, first of all, it, we're a system of delegated powers, and the, and in the in the wisdom of the people, they specifically delegated certain powers to the national government, and they retained powers in the states. All right, and that is ultimate power, right? Certain powers are going to this to, to the national government, and then certain powers. So doesn't that, that, as you just said, doesn't that create dual masters, and therefore that is dual sovereignty. Um, I would yes, but ultimately they're not they're not co-equal partners, right? Someone in that situation, and and Tim alluded to the treaty clause, perhaps necessary and proper, or the supremacy clause. There, there, I think there are several places within the Constitution of which of which all those clauses, man, they provide so much clarity to that question that we have lived. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I understand the nuanced intellectual approach you guys are taking, but from a, you know, from, from a simpleton like myself, I, I'm sorry, it, it's dual sovereignty, which is they, they, they had to know. In fact, I do believe that Madison and, uh, you know, and Hamilton understood this, uh, that, that they had set up a system, you know, and, and maybe on purpose for some valid reasons for constant tension. All right. Uh, and, and, um, tension, not in a good way necessarily, but tension uh, and always living on the edge of conflict. Well, I, think, I think, David, if you wanted to make the argument that it did up, set up dual sovereignty, um, I think just thinking about what they called taxation during the articles, it was called the requisition system. Congress requested money from the states. Well, who's who's sovereign <laughs> then uh, along comes the constitution where it's it's direct taxation uh so i think you're if if you want to make the constitution the constitutional arrangement coming out of philadelphia just simply looking at how money is raised by the national government i think could play into your view that there's dual sovereignty because both now have a direct way of raising money whereas before states were in the driver's seat because they were it was like a free will offering in a lot of ways uh, well, that the states had and I, I and I, you guys have heard me say this before and this is what i think is a really important thing for students to take a look at is that last paragraph of the declaration of independence because as free and independent states you know as say what do they have the power to do they get to raise taxes right uh, they get to levy war they get to conclude peace they get to negotiate their own treaties they get to do everything that free and independent states got to have get to do so that's 76 right so that's 76 that comes out we win the war again spoiler alert um and then 11 years later there's this radical document coming out of philadelphia that just changes everything and to try and get people that mindset to change Right. The idea that, oh, wait, we have a, a, a new government, a uh, new sovereign government, you know, and we're used to having this local control and um, it, to, to try and change that mindset in such a short period of time, because most of the people, uh, I should say most of the people, many people were very provincial in their viewpoints. You know, they're very parochial. They can only see what they can see within their perhaps their county. Um, they don't see big picture. They're not from 30,000 feet. They're boots on the ground kind of people like a Daniel Shays, right? And others. So to change that mindset from 76 to 87, 88, uh, 17, 76 kids and 1787 to 1788, that's, that's a heavy lift to try and change that. So of course you're gonna have, you're gonna have this, right? Which is right. In, intentional or not. I mean, that's what's gonna happen. Well, they, yeah, that that's true. Uh, Professor uh, Williams, is America unique in the world in its structure of, again, 
whether you agree or not, let's just run with my, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, my position here. And that is uh, uh, of both the national and state governments having some element of sovereignty. Are we unique in the world or is that pretty much the status quo in the 18th uh, century and, and as we move on uh, to the more modern era? I would say we're not unique because there are other systems in the world that are federal, right? Um, but in terms of, you know, there's not as many federal systems as there are unitary systems. So there's, I mean, one way for the students to think about this is in a unitary system, like what Britain has today, what Japan has today, the central government um, is in charge of most policymaking and most taxation, which is very, very different than our federal system. But there are other systems in the world right now that we would call political science, we call them con confederal, but I don't think it has a different meaning today than it did 200 years ago. Because a system like South Africa says, we are going to enumerate what powers the states have, and whatever we don't mention we're gonna assume comes to the central government. So that's, that's giving the central government even more power, right? I mean, a federal system like we have it on paper is about as fair as you, you can get in terms of splitting up the power. I think, and I think Tim and Chris have alluded to this, to some extent, the constitutional legal de jure question of federalism is somewhat solved in this in 1789 but the cultural understanding of you know who has the right to rule me you just said they have about, about mindset that is not resolved and i would argue it's not resolved today i think it's it's still just a part of our culture that many people would say um the national government doesn't have the right to tell me what to do in name the circumstance. That cultural mindset, when I look across the globe and I look at other federal systems, that's unique, I think. I mean, our cultural understanding of what sovereignty means is much different than I think most other places in the world when they think of subnational units having sovereignty. In those places, it's much more legalistic, much more constitutional, and it seems to me the United States, it's much more cultural in a lot of ways. Okay, and I think that's, I, I like that insight, but I just wanna make sure I understood. You, you say from a de, de jure perspective, it's pretty much settled in 1789. So you kind of joined with Chris there uh, in, in that gang that this isn't nearly as ambiguous uh, as, as I see it, uh, even in the early years. Uh, did I understand that correctly? Well, it's ambiguous because we're going to have to interpret what the supremacy clause means, right? And we're going to have to, right? But it's it's in the document. There are some constitutions that just may not even have a supremacy clause. They're just gonna they're just gonna leave it open to even more debate. So, to the extent that it's it's in the document, now it needs to be worked out for sure. But I think I think the constitution on paper makes it pretty clear Congress has certain enumerated powers, right? What, what's not mentioned there goes to the states, but if there's a conflict between the states and the national government, the federal government trumps it with those enumerated powers. I mean, we've talked about this in other episodes. We can't, we're not gonna create, we shouldn't be creating constitutions that look like Napoleonic codes. Like we just can't have it that detailed. So <laughs> that's why. I say it's all as much as it can be. Well, and I go ahead, Chris. Well, I just listen, Mike. I really like how you talk about the de jure versus uh, cultural, and it makes me think today uh, we focus on that we the people part. We're the people. We have the power, but we forget the end of that preamble. It says, "Do ordain and establish this constitution." Right. So we forget that part. That oh, there's a document here that has a listing of enumerated powers, and one of those happens to be the supremacy clause among others so we forget that part so um. as, as as mike was talking i couldn't help but think about the culture of uh, secession 
I mean, you, you look at a couple of those secession, I think it's South Carolina, it's just a wonderful example of this, of this cultural piece. They, they basically, when they secede, they do it, by, and they make the statement, uh, you know what we said back in 1788, we're just going to reverse that. Uh, we're going to undo our ratification of the Constitution. Well, there's a cultural statement about state sovereignty, as deep as is, <laughs> uh, that would have been December of, uh, of 1860. So I think Mike's point's well taken that, that uh, you know, that arrangement on paper is still going to take some time to sort through culturally uh, and ideologically. Well, and I think partly what you mean by this, Mike, is this cultural notion is this notion of identity. And it seems to me that the way we structured is we've got a who's your daddy problem. Uh, and that is, you know, uh, we have an identity problem. You know, I mean, when am I a Californian and when am I an American? Uh, and, and that creates a tremendous amount of tension. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, secession here in a moment. Uh, so would you, it's in my sense, and, and correct me, please, if I'm wrong, we seem to have many more conflicts, all right, born out of this cultural misunderstanding than other, you know, uh, so-called federal systems of government. Would, would that be accurate based upon your understanding or uh, no, we're, in that sense, we're not unique as well? I mean, I know Canada has, Canada has its, its issues. They're having a big issue now, very similar uh, to ours and the, the central states, uh, uh, or territories of, of Canada uh, rebelling against the coastal uh, elements in some ways. Uh, you know, uh, I know Sp Spain uh, has had a breakaway state there. So I'm just wondering, you know, I, I understand other nations, but it just seems to me this is an ongoing, continuous conflict that other as other nations look upon us, they've always got to be somewhat aware that America isn't a union as they might understand it. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think it's important that that the American exceptionalism argument dies here, right? We are more like other countries across the world in terms of having different identities and those identities causing conflict. I think that's a, that's that's a fair point for sure. But what strikes me, and this is more his, this is historical and cultural. I just can't think. I think about you know the creation of the. 52 African states after colonialism, right? And most of them, most of those nation states brought together diverse identities, um, put them into a nation state and said, okay, you, you, have to, you have to stay here, right? Nigeria, you are Nigeria, work it out. And, and that was part of the bargains of ending colonial rule. It was kind of like, you, we're only gonna end colonial rule if you agree to these territorial boundaries and you sign on to it, and they did. In our founding moment, the 13 colonies made a choice. Like our whole, our, our whole culture, our rhetoric is based on this idea of choice and consent, right? Which you don't get in a lot of other places. It was by force. And now they're just forced into this box that they've learned to live with and they can't, the, the international community is not gonna let them get out of it. And what's interesting about the United States history, I think, is that because there was consent, we agreed to go into it. It circles back to Tim's point. South Carolina can say 60 years later, or seven years later, you know what? Just as we chose to get into this thing, we're choosing to get out. We're, no, you know, the, the mighty Great Britain Empire didn't make us come together. We chose to come together to beat them. Now we've, we've solved that problem. Let's just split off. And I think that that tension is still with us in ways that you don't find in other places in the world. I think it has to do with our, with the founding narrative. It might not be the correct history, but it's the founding narrative about how we came together, 13 independent colonies choosing to come together. That idea of choice, I think it, I think it means something special in the United States. Chris? Yeah, I just want to, I, I, I want to, for the students, I want them to understand too, but there were also other people that saw us as a nation, right? I think of uh, John Marshall's biography and who was encamped with Washington's army at Valley Forge. And he writes in his autobiography about understanding that we're creating a new nation because you have men from all of these states representing all these brand new states, if you will. 
in 77, this winter of 77 and 78, I believe. Um, so he's writing about this and seeing that we were forming a new nation, not a conglomerate of uh, associations. And I was just, uh, for, for my class, I was just reading up on some uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who is uh, the Colonel of the 20th Maine, and um, some of his writings after the war. And by the way, students, if you want to look up one of the original bad askers of questions, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is your man. He was a, he was a tough dude and also very cerebral. But some of his writings post-Civil uh, War, talking about the states and their relationship to the national government, and they are subservient, and um, I'm, I'm not going to do it justice, but it reminds me of John Marshall, the idea of they, they have that 30,000-foot view of the country and not uh, something that's at, on the ground level, can see the nation for what it was, and that's why uh, Chamberlain, when he could have walked away, his time was up, he reissued, or he, he signed up again to continue fighting um, because he wanted to preserve the Union. Um, I'd like to push back a little bit on, on Mike. Uh, as, I, as I read the founding, uh, I, mean, this, I mean, I think the easy way to think about uh, cultures uh, at the founding as well, there's there's the North, there's the middle states, and then there's the South, and then there's this new cultural possibility called uh, the West. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's true to, to a large degree. M many people did fear that this, their, the West would be a new cultural ident uh, identity uh, in, in the Eastern, East of the Appalachian that caused a lot of um, concern. But I'd also say that there's an Upper South and a Lower South. There's Maryland and then there's Pennsylvania. I mean, they're, they're, um, there's, I mean, Massachusetts is not like uh, Connecticut. Um, there's always this question about Vermont, uh, you know, so that there, we, we have these identities and it's amazing that, they, I mean, if, if Mike is right, that there was a, a unity consensus of some degree, it's really remarkable because I think the, uh, the identities, I still think ran pretty thick even at the founding period, even when there's this this uh, uh, unity arrangement uh, to some degree, but there there are some cultural tensions that persist and will persist all the way up through and even after the Civil War. I I, I agree, Tim, and I think I mean that's consistent with what I was saying. Maybe I wasn't making it clear. I I I I, I kind of think that the um, the consensus on coming together for a lot of folks is a very limited reason right it's to it's to protect us from other big bad countries and and to protect us from ourselves from the domestic sort of insurrections we were seeing yeah. um and just because you decide to come together and you, you know you get you get it ratified by the <laughs> by the skin on your chinny chin chin doesn't mean that like everyone decides that we're just going to be like this nation that Chris is talking about, yeah, there are some like John Marshall who believed in that, um, but it's it's not something that exists. It's something that has to be like forged and created and and stuff. And um, I, I think our our journey on doing that as a country has had its it's had some of its unique challenges that are based in the founding. So I I think I'm agreeing with what you were saying. Okay. Well, I I would. It, it seems to me that, that we have a consensus that we are birthed in the notion of state sovereignty. And I, I like the way you said it there, Professor Williams, that if we're going to have a, a, a union and a national identity, that has to be forged and shaped, shaped over time. And it seems to me that John Marshall plays a fairly big role in attempting to do so. Uh, and, you know, and I, as I kind of thought about this next question to Professor Moore, I realized just sometimes I try to take too simple of an approach to something that's probably uh, much more nuanced. Uh, obviously, we also have a consensus that the maybe the most central question issue problem of the very existence of America is about power and this notion of sovereignty and this question of how much sovereignty do ind individual states uh, have uh, there. Um, and it is the central question in the in the the, the early national period, the antebellum period. Uh, uh, there, I'm wondering, Professor Moore, if you could maybe 
you know, talk about or give some guidance to what you see as some of the key issues, debates that arose maybe in that first 50 or so years to illustrate, all right, this key question of power? Yeah, um, right out of the chute, uh, there's a federal state question on the Whiskey Rebellion. Did the federal government have the ability to call out the militias of, uh, and they eventually do, of uh, three or four states to go suppress this uh, rebellion? I mean, Alien Sedition Acts leads to some of the uh, great early documents resisting uh, federal power, uh, the Kentucky Resolutions and the Virginia Resolutions, um, ri uh, Virginia written by uh, Madison, Kentucky by um, Jefferson. Uh, the Hartford Convention, right in the middle of the war, New England doesn't want anything. To, they, they actually, I mean, you look at the Hartford Convention document, and it's almost a veiled threat of secession. And by northern states, that's what I think is hilarious. Uh, the personal liberty laws uh, pre pre Civil War are a great example of states wanting to still retain some sovereignty to determine, you know, whether they're going to cooperate with the fugitive slave laws. Uh, the nullification crisis and and the tariff in the late 20s and 30s um it's something as simple as what to do with uh, i think they were called the webster hain debates starts out as this discussion about revenue sharing in some ways who gets the money from the sale of lands in the west do states get to keep it or does the national government keep? and some of the greatest speeches that ever occurred in the senate were uh have have been uh, come out of this the Webster Hain debate. So they're <laughs> they're fighting about who is who is has more power, the national or the or the state governments. I mean, the Kansas Nebraska Act uh, let let these new newly created states determine this issue of slavery. So I mean, I I think federalism is an unresolved issue. I don't think it ends at the Civil War. I think there's an agreement here around the circle that it continues after the Civil War as well. But certainly most uh it's all over the antebellum world well I, i'm curious is there any like and, and of course i guess my my approach has usually been through case law all right looking at the martial court uh sure. more, most specifically but is there any question major question in that first 50 years that's not a federal question other than maybe the power of the court uh, in marbury versus madison and separation of powers there uh, precious <laughs> few i mean you look at ogden co uh cohen um the uh there was like five of really super duper great cases where marshall slaps the states around oh dartmouth college was another one uh so yeah i mean but i think that may go back to to, to mike's point about you have this constitutional rhetoric of what the constitution means coming out of the court but so many of those policy fights in Congress, it's like they're not paying any attention to what Marshall said in these high and lofty court decisions. I mean, that that list of, I don't know, half a dozen things that he just went through, that's like congressional stuff. And it's, they're just saying like tone deaf to what Marshall is saying the Constitution mean, this national Constitution that he's articulating. Well, but that list, the, where's Barron fit in there then? Is that that is well that, that's the great that's that, the great curveball right uh um, well it's it's really not well, but now he's being a textualist there's, there's, there he's being a great textualist uh you're you're you can't you can't come uh you can't come to this court for that stay stay in baltimore they, they're the ones that shafted you not the national government right i mean he, he's articulating the framers intent on this federalism of rights uh notion and that these rights mr baron only apply to congress all right, and uh, you want uh, you want to find some relief, you know, go to your state legislature uh, uh, here, but you know, or and again, I'm surprised Maryland didn't have a property rights uh, uh, a property rights in their constitution, there, Mr. Moore. Uh, I, they probably did, but this uh, um, I don't I don't know. I mean, I I, 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 I was thinking about that today because I was to me it is somewhat of an outlier. But when you come to think about it, it really is still dealing with, you know, uh, where does this individual go for relief? All right. And, you know, how is our system structured for that individual uh, to uh, address that? Uh, other than Barron, and again, students, there are so many issues. I think Mr. Moore has laid out a few for you. And, you know, most of the work is up to you, students and teachers, uh, to figure out the rest. 
uh, uh, there. But uh, I think we may have a consensus that almost every question, uh, uh, almost, not all, but uh, really comes down to this as, as Mike talks about shaping this union. Uh, and from a, from a Marshall and Federalist point of view, in the sense that they do want a much stronger national government uh, in that, you know, uh, uh, to emerge out of that. Yeah, Tim. And that's why there was so much resistance to the American plan. Uh, the Whigs, near and dear to my heart. Your guys. Uh, yeah. You know, the Whigs really pushed this American plan and there's so much resistance to it because the localists see this American plan as usurping state uh state sovereignty and state control of things and so um you, you know so it, this blowback i think to my to mike's point you've got this what's on coming out of the court and what's on the text of the constitution and then all of these policy issues that congress is wrestling with it's like they didn't get the message they weren't paying attention to marshall so professor kavanaugh we've kind of touched upon it and you know, and I think about the historiography of the Civil War, um, and I and I I don't know about you and Tim, but I was taught uh, in high school, and in fact, even in uh, my uh, freshman year uh, uh, history class at, at at junior college, that it was a the, the war was about states' rights and state sovereignty uh, there, and of course, you know, you bring slavery in, but in the end that was ultimately about sovereignty. Uh, so uh, I guess, it, is it, to what extent was the Civil War um, about this notion of sovereignty, in your opinion? And was it all about sovereignty? Or, you know, we then get to 1863, 1864, and we try to turn it into a human rights kind of uh, war uh, <laughs> well, there. That, I'm glad I got a chuckle. That, well, that's just Lincoln trying to that's Lincoln trying to keep England out of the war, right? Um, you know, because he's worried about the, the, he's worried about that. And I mean, Lincoln famously says that you know his goal is to preserve the Union. If he could preserve the Union by freeing all the slaves, he would do it. If he could preserve the Union by freeing none or some, he would do it. But um, I'm going to say that David, it is about sovereignty. But there's a huge but in here because I do believe that slavery is at the root of the Civil War. There's no doubt in my mind because Tim alluded to the the South Carolina document of secession. You just have to read it, and it tells you what it's there. Our, our, and I'm sure students are are familiar with uh, uh, Alexander Stevens' cornerstone speech, where he talks about the cornerstone of the Confederacy being that of slavery. And you know, you read Stevens' speech, how the framers were wrong, how now the not the framers but the founders were wrong on this notion of equality. And he's clear it's about white supremacy. So it's about sovereignty. It's about the state's power to enslave people, right? What do they want that power for? They want that power so they can continue to the, what they call their peculiar institution, right? They want to continue the institution of slavery. That but is. It, it, but it, it, I mean, there is a, and again, I, I know I'm probably going to drown here, but. You know, on a previous session, we talked about privileges and immunities, uh, and we've talked about full faith and credit. I mean, isn't there it is it one of the arguments that 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 slave states make is that their commercial property rights are not being respected by Congress by closing off the Western Territory and the Missouri Compromise, uh, uh, you know, in that period of time. Uh, and and to a certain degree, the the hostility towards uh, slavery yeah, aren't, aren't they becomes, violating? But that becomes disingenuous after Dred Scott, because after Dred Scott, and when Taney says Congress has no power to regulate slavery in the territories, so in '57 when that decision comes down, it's like Katie bar the door. Because now that argument about well you cut out our livelihood because we can't ex no you can take now. Uh, thanks to the Supreme Court, you can take your property, if you will, uh, these people that have been enslaved, you can take them with you. Uh, and of course, we're well aware of, of Tani's dicta in that case about, you know, black people have no rights that so white people are bound to respect. Um, so but that, create, that, that in itself creates now, I don't know if you want to call it irony or a flip of the coin, because now you have states like Illinois and others 
with their, I think Tim mentioned personal liberty laws or liberty laws, arguing that you know they have the sovereign right, all right, to not follow the fugitive slave clause. Well, that, that, occur, that occur, the few, uh, uh, a lot of the personal liberty laws were pre Dred Scott too. Yeah, and they were pre Dred Scott and they got slapped down. Yeah. States like Pennsylvania, uh, other states, uh, Wisconsin, um, they get slapped down by the courts because they're, now we're talking about sovereignty. Who's got sovereignty? The Constitution has sovereignty. And the Constitution says you will do this. Mike, I think Luke, Mike wants to jump well, in. Well, I, I, just let me follow. But I agree with you that the, uh, many of those laws were passed before Dred Scott. But doesn't the temperature rise as far as the application of those laws after Dred Scott? Well, it they, they rises, yeah. And people are going to argue and cuss and discuss about it. But the court, in many cases prior to Dred, uh, have have sided with the the fusion slave clause from the, the original one in the constitution as well as the one uh, ratified as part of the compromise of 1850. Well, I, I guess the thing I'm trying to point out is that I think I don't think most American students are aware when they hear you know the argument about states' rights and the Civil War, they are always thinking about the the Southern slave states and their rights to have slavery take those slaves they're not as aware that there are other states who are making a state sovereignty argument as well on the flip side of the coin. Yep. True. And, true. and that's what I wanted to point out. Professor no, Williams, you've been very patient. Before, my, sorry, Mike, and this is one of my pet peeves, students, states don't have rights, states have powers. We have I rights. I know that. But... Governments have powers. Okay, I feel better now. Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> state sovereignty. Oh, yes. I just wanted to double down on what Chris was saying and probably get slapped around by a few of you right now, but um, not only is the Civil War, like you need to link sovereignty to slavery. Um, when I was looking up today, like, you know, what are the, what do, what do we say about why do, why do countries choose federal systems? Well, they choose federal systems when there's ethnic minor, minorities or when there's subgroups that wanna be protected. You, um, you create federalism when you wanna counteract majority rule. You um, enact federalism if, you, if there are subnational bosses that want to be protected. And so to me, the seeds of state sovereignty moving from the Articles of Confederation, where the states could, like, like Tim and Chris were saying, the states could basically say, we're either going to cooperate or not, but you can't force us. Moving to a system where there is just a Congress that says we have these enumerated powers, it's not that big of a move, re really. But it's big enough to where the slave interest demands certain sex, uh, certain structural protections, and that to me is that's that's the Senate and that's federalism. There are other reasons I think why we have a federal system, but I think even at the founding we can't. Students need to think about the role of slavery there. It's not something that just comes out of the blue in the Civil War. It's it's in the seeds of the very document. It's in that very compromise and. I'm not sure if all of you agree with that, but that's, I just wanted to throw that out there. So, Chris, we, we get... Definitely agree. We, we get, therefore, to the post-Civil War, the Reconstruction era, and it seems to me that the Congress has finally come to the same conclusion that possibly Hamilton and the Continentalists did in 1781 and Madison did in 1787, that, you know, and it, not, not necessarily in relation to equality, all right? But if we're going to emphasize equality, we can't do it under the current Constitution. All right, we're going to have to rearrange this sovereignty issue in order to pursue equality as a value. Is that an accurate understanding? I'm sorry, was that to me? Yeah, it was there to you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think so. I think that's I think that's an accurate understanding. I would agree. That we have to. Tim looks like he's ready to jump here, but I I think that that is I think that's a pretty good description, actually, David. Well, at, at its root, I mean, it, it, to go back to your previous question, to what extent was it states' uh, sovereignty versus, uh, and to what extent was it slavery? I think you don't have to look much past the Thirteenth and the Fourteenth Amendment, especially Section One, Fourteenth, to answer your question: what the Civil War was about. <laughs> see Thirteenth, see Fourteenth Amendment, Section One. Um, now again, that's like maybe the northern answer <laughs> what the civil war was about, but we'll call those I, people the winners, 
Uh, well, but you know, there, there's there's your answer. It was about slavery, and it was about uh, about state sovereignty and the state's powers being clipped in the Fourteenth Amendment. Well, then, then, then I doesn't this bring up the impotency impotency of of written constitutions? Okay, so we we address the problem, as you say, in the Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Amendments. Uh, uh, there we rearrange federalism. We now create national citizenship. We now give the national government far more power to act on states and individuals within states to protect rights and such. Um, yet we go another hundred years and the world really doesn't look that much different in 1910, 1920, 1930 as it does in 1860. Isn't I mean, there's no. We, it, isn't this where we cue Mike's? Uh, uh, it takes a political will. Uh, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> on paper versus political will right but it Sorry, also I'm, I'm treading i'm treading on your stick yeah, here no go like, for it you no, got it no yeah this this is yours this is yours well yeah, I mean, go ahead dave you go ahead well again it's you know and here's here's the, the magical word resolve which of these issues did the reconstruction era amendments resolve well it didn't resolve any of them all right, they changed the words. All right, there's shit power, and we're going to have a, a few years. All right, of uh, celebrating uh, Reconstruction, but then it, it it dies in many ways, or it goes into a coma for a hundred years at least. Uh, there, which is again, to me, reveals the, the you know the the you know the the weakness of written constitutions that not that are not absorbed into the hearts and minds of the people. And I don't think the original constitution or the post-Civil War constitution was ever absorbed into the hearts and minds of the American people. That, that, you know, I guess that's my contention there. Well, so, there, therein, there, therein lies the issue, David. And I, you know, we've said this, and I've said this before. It's not the constitution or perhaps the 13th, 14th, 15th or, or, or subsequent legislation uh, that is weak. It is our ability to buy into it. Right. It's not it's, it's operator error. It's the it's the racism and, and that's built into part of the system as well. Um, so I think it's the, like, overcoming, you know, uh, that hundred, couple hundred years of our nation's beginning uh, with the institution of slavery preserved within our original documents um, to overcome that. I've got a great poster up in my room from Frederick Douglass, and he says there is no Negro problem. It's where the American people have honor enough, courage enough, patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution. And, and Dr. King said it in, you know, the, in 1965, uh, the night before he was killed, be true to what you write on paper, right? And well, we struggle and with that because of our, the, 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 what's on paper versus what our culture has told us. So that's the human element uh, within, our, within our system that has been a struggle to overcome. But this yeah. is what I, go ahead, Mike. I, this is where I think um, I think it's just part of the storyline of the United States. This is never going to be resolved because there was never a consensus at the beginning about what sort of union we wanted to create. I mean, it, to some extent, I mean, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it it rhymes a lot, right? And um, a lot of the debates I hear going on today are in the same key right as debates we've been having for 250 years in terms of who gets to have full and equal access to be a citizen what does that mean what are the what should the states be doing to ensure that like we debate we we don't even debate things like socioeconomic rights those are just off the table we're debating whether the state has a role to play to protect our voting rights i mean that should be I mean, in most democracies in the world, like Sweden, Finland, <laughs> uh, Canada, that's a given the state protects your right to vote. That is, we, we debate that in this country and we do it with a straight face. Like it's okay that we have a, an election during the week when we know people can't vote. It's okay to ask for people to show ID when we know that certain people in the society don't have ID. We have these debates like they're principled, and it's the same debate we've been having about who actually gets to be a full-fledged citizen. And I don't think any constitution or any amendment is going to solve that. 
it's going to be the debate we're going to have until until the end. I think. Well, well and you, I think go. there's there's uh, I think there's one thing that it, no matter what time period in American history you go to, that there is a consensus on what kind of nation we want to be. Uh, Hamilton had an idea of what kind of nation we wanted to be, and it was a commercial republic, and he had a whole agenda there. The Whigs had a whole commercial agenda, uh, a national economy. Uh, the Republicans, uh, during the war, create the Homestead Act, the, the Railway Act, the Banking Act. There's a whole lot of national commercial goals. And, and then you get into the Gilded Age, the Republican Party champions this notion of a, a national commercial republic. And it's all this other stuff. So I think there's a consensus throughout our history on that. All this other stuff about uh, rights and and uh, uh, and equality is is um, it, it's almost like we can agree on a uh, we want a McDonald's at every ramp exit ramp. <laughs> we want that commercial republic, and then all this other stuff. And to your point, Mike, maybe we're destined to constantly be fighting about these other issues. Uh, although the commercial republic, there's some questions about, about how uniform do we want that commerce to be in, in a lot of these more recent decisions about whether I have to bake a cake for a gay couple or not. So, Well, and I'm sorry, Professor Moore, I, I'd say that those those debates were very intense, even in the Gilded Age. All right. Sure. Uh, which which helps explain. So I don't I mean, if you say that because that's how history played out, it represents a consensus on that vision of a commercial republic, then yeah, I agree with you. But I do think we, you know, we'd, we'd have to acknowledge that it was a long and arduous process because there were always those going, wait a minute, okay, so we want to connect the Western states and the Eastern states with a national system of railroads. What power are those railroads going to have? All right, what's the impact on labor that those railroad companies are going to have? You know, and there's the constant ongoing questions about this commercial republic sure. uh, there. Uh, I, I think we, we have to acknowledge. Uh, uh, Mike, it's, were you going to jump in? Well, I was just going to chime in with something that's been in the news last week. The Supreme Court hearing, hearing those cases over Twitter and um, and Google, right? Is it Was it Google? And the it's Justice Facebook. League, Facebook. They, they seem to be really kind of pushing back in terms of, if the whole internet's going to crash because we have to make a rule <laughs> about how it's supposed to, we're just not going to make a rule. Like, or we're not going to be the ones to do it. Well, they said, it, <laughs> uh, well, I, it's one of those. I, I agree with them. They say it's Congress's job to do that. It totally uh, is. And, you know, and uh, and right, and Congress isn't going to do it. No, uh, you know, kind of thing. So, and, and you kind of anticipated my next question, Mike, and I think you've already kind of answered it. That uh, we are, we are, to me in the midst of two great discussions, one or two great situations. One is the reemergence of the state sovereignty argument. And I think you just pretty much uh, address that, that we're, we're having you know, debates over voting rights, all right? And states are arguing that they should have more uh, you know, sovereign control over uh, running elections. Heck, we're even having debates over what is our national narrative? we can't even really agree on how we would teach to each generation what that national narrative is uh, uh, in the 21st uh, uh, century. But, you know, so, I mean, would you agree with me there, Professor Williams, we're in a rollback period, all right, that, that you know, maybe from post-World War II to the 1990s, early aughts, you know, we have more of, I guess we'd call it a federalist or nationalist approach, but, you know, with always that voice of dissent, with always pushback by states, but the national government does get more consolidation, but now we are seeing the states emerge as much more powerful entities. To me, it seems as almost any time in my, in my lifespan. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know if I would say there was that period of, of, what you just said, nationalist in the 1990s. I mean, Clinton's the one who gave us welfare reform that basically put, put it all back on the states. I mean, I, I, I think to think about this. I think, I mean, you all have raised this. The, the nation was founded in terms of like, a, we're scared of Britain. 
let's not get unanimous decision. Let's get nine out of 13 and let's just go for it in this ratification things. Let's get it done. And then immediately like whiskey rebellion, other things, the national government kind of comes up and says, we're going to force, we're going to do this, right? The civil war, as the students should probably know, the civil war amendments were only ratified because there was military occupation in the South. Once the military occupation leaves, we get the redemption period. The 1960s, the successes of the civil rights period are when the national government step in with power and force and national guard and passing legislation. To me, you know, the nadir there is 1968. I mean, since 1968, there has been a, a gradual rollback of the national government. Um, I mean, it ebbs and flows, but I, I think it's been a, the times in our history where the national government has been super strong on domestic issues has been short windows. They come in and they get a lot of, a lot done, but as soon as they back away, that vacuum is filled by, yeah. I states and they start pushing back and doing other things. I, that, that's the way I see the history going, but I'm not sure. Well, I mean, that's, that's the whole unfolding of the Reagan revolution. I think um, is, is uh, what was his campaign uh, um, uh, governments, uh, federal government's not the solution. It's the problem. And so I think we've seen, we've seen that unfold and we now have, certain members i mean uh margie green i mean she wants to create create red states and blue state countries i mean oh man uh so yeah i mean that's that's scary stuff when, when you hear that stuff ram rumbling around uh so it's good to know that even mitt romney's scratching his head on that one uh chris any thoughts about well, I was, what well, mike I was, is I was i was going to mention uh you know under president reagan this new federalism right and the part of what Tim already said, the Reagan Revolution, but he talked about it being this new federalism of putting the onus back on the states. We're going to return power, if you will, to the states to let them decide, um, which, you know, going back to the whole idea of, uh, you know, reducing the, the size of the federal government so you could drown in the bathtub. I think you grow over Norquist and tax reform, uh, but you start to see that. But now I would agree with you, David, we are we, we the pendulum has swung back now and tim mentioned uh congresswoman green and her recent comment uh, which in essence seems like she's promoting this disunion i i guess you, that would be the best way to say it i, so I don't we, i mean you know she's got you know she's got an outlet unlike anyone else before in history but this has been a constant theme we've had people talking about you know divorce secession throughout our history, um, you know, some more serious than others, quite possibly. No, David, I would, Dave, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold, I, I agree with you, but we've always seen that element, whether it be in Alaska, or we've seen some people perhaps in, in Northern California, or in, in pockets, or maybe Northern Idaho, uh, we've seen this in pockets, but we've always seen them as fringe, right? We, and we look, and everybody, go, oh yeah, yeah, secession, yeah, yeah, uh, but now, You've got a sitting member of Congress who sits on the Homeland Security. I think this is, and and, and you're right. She has a huge microphone, um, and I think that um, I think it's worse now. It's more troubling now, uh, and, and there, there, there um, I don't think that we have as many adults. I, I think you're giving a loudmouth idiot way too much, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, power. You know, it, because if what were what were to what she wants to happen, what would happen in her great state of Georgia? And, and of course, it just shows how ignorant she is, because it's this isn't this isn't a simple Mason Dixon line, North South kind of situation. Well, it's, all right. It's, if it's, Wisconsin's going to do that, well, wh where's Milwaukee go? Yeah. All right. You know, is Milwaukee go with Wisconsin or does Milwaukee become its own nation states of its own? I mean, how do we draw the map? Well, you, of, course, of course, it's not feasible. I'm, I'm agreeing with you, David. It's not feasible, but I'm saying it's, it's much more serious now because of her position. And I, she may be a loudmouth, she, but she has an audience. And if you look at things that are happening around the country right now, oh, my goodness. I mean, this is tangentially related. Have you seen the video out of Florida? With the guys on the street corner um, that are, uh, you know, Heil Hitler and confronting people about being Jewish 
and asking these questions like, should you have been burned in the oven? Yeah, but, and, and okay, so we go to Skokie, Illinois there. I, and I'm not disagreeing with you in the totality, Chris. I'm more concerned about what's happening in the halls of Congress and what's happening in the courts, all right? And, and you guys mentioned the Reagan revolution. Well, the Reagan revolution never really lived out under Reagan. To me, right. what we're living is the Reagan revolution now. Yes. Absolutely. Right. And Absolutely. If, we, if we look at the court decided this week to take up the Consumer Protection Agency, uh, and uh, you know, they're going to dismantle that. We see what they're going to do, the administrative agencies uh, there. Um, we're seeing what they did with Dobbs and uh, uh, and, and what they're going to do with health care. So I agree with you in spirit. I just, you know, those to me, they're still fringe. They get much more coverage because of social media and CNN, AB, all the other big ones. They follow social media. David, you're not fringe when you sit in the halls of Congress. You're not fringe when you sit on the Homeland Security. But I tell you, the bigger issue right now for me is where the court will come down in Moore versus Harper, because that case will determine a lot of things in terms of throwing power back to the states uh, and especially in elections. So when that comes out, and with this court, and I'm very concerned with this current makeup of the court, um, I think that case and this whole issue of federalism that we've been discussing and debating, I think that is, that is something we definitely have to keep our uh, eyes on. Mike? Yeah, I, I just wanted to raise for the students, like, um, to also just think about what's happening more broadly in society. And I'll put into the, to the notes, there's a book by Kathleen Bellew called Bring the War Home. And, and her metric is the rise in militias. And the, you know, today our federal government tells us the biggest threat to the United States is domestic terrorism, terrorism right? So she tracks this rise in militias. And, and this is where the, the, the narrative of sovereignty, it's, it's getting delinked from state sovereignty. Yes. The notion of this, like, the people yeah. are sovereign. So me and a group of my, my fellow <laughs> friends, get together with enough power, weapons, and we just decide that we are sovereign. Like, isn't that the lesson of American history? And unless we do a better job educating people, that's, that, that is the exact opposite lesson of American history, right? That is, that is what I think most the founders, whether they're Patrick Henry or whether they're Madison or Hamilton are all looking and saying, that's mob rule, that's a chaos that we need some sort of structured government to control but that's where it's getting delinked, and um, the rise of you know the use of weapons and the rise of militias, it's the same sort of thing. And that's where people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, I think she's tapping in to that sort of cultural attitude that I don't see, to be honest, every day in my community. But the reports tell me it's in my community, right? I just don't see it, and it's probably in more of our communities than we actually recognize. Well you should come to my community because my community might be a little different than Southern California. Fair point. <laughs> if you're inviting me, I'll be there, CC. No, you make, won't. Make, make, too, make sure it's in cool. July, Mike. Uh, you don't want to yeah. go right now. Make sure it's in July. So uh, <laughs> we've come to the end, gentlemen. Uh, so as we uh, historically do here, if you could uh, provide any final thoughts, insights, recommendations to students and teachers as they approach this uh, uh, question. Uh, Professor Williams? I just got done talking. This has been great. I know. You're on a roll. <laughs> I, think this, I think the students should recognize that I think an hour or so ago, I'm not even sure how long ago, this all started with Patrick Henry back in the 1780s. <laughs> we ended with Marjorie Taylor Greene and militias. So this the notion of like sovereignty, right? Who has the right and power to rule? And um, it's a fundamental question of politics. You can look at a constitution and tell yourself that it should be solved or resolved or something. Um, in most places, it's not. And in the United States, it's definitely not. So this, this question, um, I think our conversation has shown you the arc of where it can go in a discussion amongst yourselves as, as teams and maybe in the hearings. So I think it's a fun question to answer. Professor Kavanaugh. Um, ditto what Mike said, but I think I, I kind of struggle with this question because I think this question is so broad. It starts, it starts what looks to be like uh, a federalism question, 
which it is, you know, who has that sovereign, who's the sovereign. And it takes this big turn into a rights question, right? And the idea of creating this more perfect union. So uh, I just think it's, this is a very expansive question between the stem and in, in, into the two bullets about the reconstruction amendments. Because obviously, as students know, the 14th Amendment itself, it could be, holy smokes, could be a whole semester of study. So I think this is a, I don't want to say it's a convoluted question. I just think it's a very broad question going from federalism to rights. And I think that I think about making these arguments about, um, you know, who's best to protect these rights. Is it the national government or is it state governments? So. Professor Moore. Yeah, I think the last hour is, should be illustrative of, of a basic um, a basic thing for students to think about. You are not going to solve the issue of federalism <laughs> and sovereignty, and that's okay. Uh, and so don't don't expect. I kind of hope folks show up to nationals and, and whoever's the judges that are hearing this question that they'll hear all kinds of stuff about unresolved federalism because i think that's what's kind of what i've heard a lot in the last hour that yeah there's this paper thing and then there's this policy thing that seems to ignore the paper at times and so i would i would uh, recommend students just kind of embrace the messiness of federalism um and uh, it's not it's not a done deal and frank and frankly maybe the most important point the whole night was mike's last point about decoupling sovereignty from even states uh that that's a remarkable statement uh and i i hadn't thought about it in that succinct of a way but uh that's a remarkable new spin on sovereignty it's not even national or state it's like individual uh, the sovereign citizen craziness so well Students and teachers, we have come to the end of what I consider a nice dynamic discussion. I cannot add anything on to what these three scholars have said about uh, what uh, you might want to think about as you approach uh, this uh, question. Uh, so uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks, we hope to uh, come to you and talk about a very non-controversial issue, and that is religion uh, yeah. there. And uh, also we want to get uh, into the uh, issue of separation of powers. So until those sessions, peace, love, yogurt, tacos, bye-bye, bye-bye.